it's an onion and you keep as you dig mm -hmm. into the genetics you realize there's just there's many more layers to the data from the transcriptomics the proteomics to all the, the methylation that's going on so it is a uh, it, it can in fact be um, a rabbit hole mm -hmm. in that regard but um, on the bright side um, this is a plant that's largely not been studied yet and right. when you look back over the last 20 years where they have applied genetics to plants the productivity gains are just massive uh -huh. um, they've just the agricultural revolution that's happened is is is, is clear as day now that like since they sequenced the rice genome and the wheat genome you can right. see the number of, of traits that they're starting to discover and how they can use that to breed for more efficiency um it's it's something when you when you see those papers you you start to recognize that like the carrying capacity of the planet isn't as limited as we might think yes uh, that we are going to get more and more effective at uh at at, at biology and, and how we as humans fit into that biology in a way that isn't as wasteful as it is today. Yeah, exactly. I mean, something that comes to mind is like, um, you know, in the classic story and movie Jurassic Park, or uh, the idea that life finds a way, you know, st right, studying, right. studying these things helps you understand how life is so adaptive and able to, um, you know, reveal different traits that you never would have imagined might have been you know, possible, um, in order to, you know, continue persisting throughout time. And it's interesting to see humans role in that. I think, um, something that I think about a lot, um, you know, sometimes people have a tendency to talk about humans as if they're outside of nature. Or, right. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, in the sense of this work, it's, you know, I don't think of it that way at all. Like we are, we are part of nature. We are part of how life is unfolding and, and interacting with itself. And so in this, in this funny way, you know, people studying genomics, doing this work, unlocking these tools and understanding how to be more conscious in how we influence life and that sort of thing. It's right, interesting. Right. It's like mother nature doing these things, you know, through itself, um, but using humans as a tool um, to this meaning. It is. Does bring up a lot of um, controversy, right? In terms yeah. of GMO, and, and yeah. should we be, should we be, are we part of nature when we start modifying nature? And and um, is this analogous to beavers building dams and bees building beehives right. and all the other tool builders out there? Uh, are we meant to utilize our intellect to do this to nature? And and that's uh, um, that's a deep topic that can go on for days. But um, my my general sense on it is there's there's multiple different ways one can be. Uh, performing GMO. I mean, arguably mm -hmm. Mendel was doing GMO. Right. He was genetic, genetically directing a breeding program. Uh, and we can do that today too, but even at a faster pace because mm -hmm. we have basically better measurements. We're not just looking at maybe the color of the peas. We're actually looking at the cannabinoids, which you can't mm -hmm. see with your eyes, or you're looking at the genes that encode them so that you can track these things at a much faster pace. But I think we're also going to be confronted in the next few years with how does the community feel about removing genes from the genome mm -hmm. not actually adding any foreign content but maybe it's important that we delete a couple um rare cannabinoids so we can comply with the usda's hemp laws right. Uh, right there are some leaky cannabinoid synthase genes in the genome and some of them you can get rid of some of them you can't depending on what your goals are um and i've seen rumors and maybe even a couple patent applications implying some people have gone about deleting uh, mm -hmm. at least thc synthase um I don't think you need GMO to do that because you can find plenty of plants that don't right. have it and just breed for it. But let's say it was some other gene you wanted to get rid of. Um, I think that's going to kind of come our way. I think the other thing we're going to see are people who are trying to be very cognizant of the fact that GMO has a marketing problem right now, uh, that they're going to try to do manipulations with the plant's own genes. They're going to maybe take the, chlor take the chloroplast genome and add stuff to it because the chloroplast genome sits at extraordinarily high copy number and you might get more expression putting certain genes there. Um, there's other people who have thought about putting other markers on the Y chromosome mm -hmm. as well. So you can find males from a drone flight. And, um, oh, interesting. That's, yeah. that's probably going to require a foreign gene. I don't know of a gene in cannabis offhand that might in fact do produce that marker, but someone, the obvious one is uh, green fluorescent protein, which was pulled out of a jellyfish. Um, that's used to mark all types of other transgenic plants. And uh, you could pop that into the Y chromosome and have your plants glow in a certain wavelength such that a drone flight could identify males or rip them out. And those males presumably won't propagate if you're good at removing them. But there's always a risk that they'll make pollen that, that could spread. Mm -hmm. And then there's a 
property rights issue as to who, you know, did you, did you get your pollen into my field and who's responsible for that? And um, with all of these modifications, uh, that also tends to bring the elephant into the room, which is patent rights. Um, it's easier to get patent rights on things that are clearly man modified than things that have been naturally bred. Um, there are breeders' rights, there are plant patents, and there are utility patents, which we're seeing roll out right now, and they can cover naturally occurring plants, uh, but it's far easier to get something through the patent office if you've clearly changed it from nature. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that moral philosophy, but yeah. that's the facts of the matter. That's what we have. Um, so I, I think we're going to be faced with a lot of these things sooner than we realize. If you actually go through the patent office today, you will find patents in there for, that have cannabis in there where they have put glyphosate resistance into them. They have put uh, human P450s into them to modify cannabinoids so that they are more water soluble upon extraction. Mm. Uh, there have been ones that um, I suspect they're going to be ones working on C3 to C4 photosynthesis conversions. And uh, there, there's a host of these mods that are already in the patent office. This doesn't mean the technology works yet. Right. Patents have no obligation to work. Uh, <laughs> there's anti-gravity devices out there, right? They're just ideas. But um, usually people don't file those unless there's some preliminary data because the expense of filing isn't something you just do on a, on a, a brain fart. Yeah. You actually want to make sure it's worth calling the lawyers for. So um, I know I see a wave of all of this innovation coming uh, into a community that has very diverse opinions on it. Uh, and, and I'm kind of, um, kind of curious where that's all going to go.